Good morning and welcome to our time of worship through the Open Bible Baptist Church. We also welcome those who are from various parts of our country and the USA and uh, possibly even in Bolivia and in other areas where people are tuning in to hear the Word of God. And we are very glad that you're tuning in and we're trusting that the uh, scriptures are a blessing to you, that our time of worship together is meaningful for you. Uh, I want to thank again Pastor Jason for uh, his work in coordinating the setup for the uh, streaming and for the feature that goes on for Mandy and her uh, tireless work in getting the music groups together and and uh, doing such a fine job at the piano and, and uh, making it so meaningful and of course for the young ladies who uh, and sometimes others uh, join in just uh, to help to make the music something that is a real blessing to us. So thank you to all and of course we do want to take just a moment to remember those who are in a time of need. Uh, Margaret Gunther is uh, due to see her uh, believe that she has seen her oncologist. She is uh, due to see uh, the specialists who are going to do an MRI and to check things out to see what further treatment is needed. They removed a large lump on the, from her brain and now the, uh, the uh, radiation and possibly other treatments options are going to be laid out for her. She would really like it if we pray for her. Uh, Peter Rampersad still on the waiting list to get his uh, triple bypass done. Continue to pray for him. June Kinsey is going in on Tuesday morning at uh, have surgery done at 11 o'clock at the uh, Elgin General Hospital and she requested that the church pray for her so we want to be doing that. And Wendy Creighton asked if we could pray for her daughter Wendy down in Oklahoma <clears throat> she has some veins in her legs that are badly clogged. Her legs are turning color and, and uh, she needs to have something done immediately. And so young Wendy is asking that uh, prayer be uh, made for her. And so we want to do that. Then I do want to just bring you an update that the petition that was signed by about 265 pastors representing churches throughout Ontario has been uh, delivered to the government and uh, we have not yet heard back to see what their actual response is but uh, we're asking you to pray the petition is done very well it's, it's written very well and uh, it, it, it really covers so much ground respectfully done but a very authoritative petition and uh, how much I appreciate that and I'm just trusting and hoping that the government will respond. I've personally written a letter to the Premier and uh, given my personal opinion about uh, what I feel about the churches uh, being on lockdown and uh, that the churches are an essential service. Uh, government may not think so. Uh, the general population may not think so. But to those who are part of the church, when they get sick or they need a funeral or they need a wedding, they need some comfort and some peace and some counsel. They soon find that the church is a very vital part of their lives. And so <clears throat> we believe it to be essential and we're asking the government. Uh, and if by some slim chance this might even get to the premier, uh, we're asking that the government respect the churches and open up. Businesses all over are opening up and people are mingling and, and they're close proximity to each other. The churches can take better care than that and can be very respectful of the restrictions. So we're asking that the government uh, become uh, soft-hearted about this and, and grant our requests. So we're asking for that and we're praying for that. So. I want us just to take a moment to uh, give a word of prayer for these folks that are ill and needing some prayer support and let's do that together. Our Father, I do thank you this morning that we can pray to a living God, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, <clears throat> the God of all eternity, who forever was and who forever will be, the eternal God. 
And uh, Lord, we're not praying to some imaginary image. We're not praying to some uh, sort of an idea. We're praying to a God who made the world, the universe, who made us, who cares and who shepherds. And uh, Lord, we're thankful that we can worship the living God and call you Abba, Father. Lord, today we pray for Marg as she will soon be undergoing some further treatment for her cancerous issue in her body. We pray for Peter that you give him rest and peace as he waits for the surgery to come. We ask you for June Kinsey as she goes into surgery on Tuesday and has a lump removed. How I pray, Lord, that you would just take care and that nothing serious will come of this. We pray that you will strengthen and encourage. And we pray for Wendy, Wendy Jr. Lord, how we pray that uh, this surgery that will take place Tuesday as well will uh, will go well for her and that she'll not have any reactions or bleeding issues associated with her situation. We commit her to you. We do ask that the government will consider this petition and that as uh, churches are meeting in parking lots, that churches might be able to open doors and have reasonable services. So I pray, Lord, that you would just grant our petition and grant our desire. It's not it's not the government that, that we're actually petitioning to. We're petitioning you and asking for your intervention so that the government will comply with that which is asked of the churches. Lord, would you bless our time and sharing together in the Holy Word of God. We ask in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen. <clears throat> Thinking about government, we've been talking about that for some time now, and I just want to again address some matters pertaining to government, and I think you will find this to be an interesting message. Uh, we've talked about our uh, responsibility towards government. We've talked about the final world government, which is the government of the Antichrist and the false system, both from the political uh, viewpoint as well as from the religious viewpoint. Uh, was very, very interesting to listen to the North Carolina group of pastors that, uh, and people that were supporting them, presenting uh, their, their plea to the government and uh, letting them know what they think. And, and uh, the churches in North Carolina are pleading for the government to open their doors. Some churches in North Carolina have already opened their doors and they are having open services and inviting people to come into their buildings. However, the council of churches the Council of Churches, their spokes lady said, we cannot do this, we must obey the government. Uh, this is what it will be like under the rule of the Antichrist and the false government that will be in place in the tribulation time. There will be a religious system that will be obedient to the Antichrist. They will not resist him. They will do his bidding. They will promote him. Anyway, I cannot take any more time to talk about that false system of the Antichrist system that is coming sometime in the near future, the rapture first, then the Antichrist, and then the horrendous unfolding of events that take place when the wrath of God is unleashed upon an unbelieving world and an unbelieving system. But to finish all of that, there is going to come another government. And that government I want to talk about today. I wish I had much more time than what I do because of the content of this government, of the, of the wonderful promise of what is yet to come. And so I want us to reflect on the idea that there will be a government, the only government ever to rule in truth. The only government to ever rule in truth. Now we honor government, we respect government. In fact, when I wrote the Premier, I called him honorable. When you write to a mayor, traditionally you write your worship because these are all protocol for the way that we write to government officials. And we do honor the powers that be. The Bible tells us that we are to do that. 
And so we do that and we show respect for the dignities and the dignitaries, I should say. But our government, whether it's the conservative, whether it is liberal, whether it is NDP, so far we've not had the green one, but it doesn't matter which government it is, they don't rule in truth. They rule by man's standards. They rule by man's guidance and man's wisdom. Uh, we hear once in a while about prayer meetings at the government house. We hear once in a while about Bible studies at government house. But we hear so little about the actual biblical principles from government. We hear so little that God has said this or that, and when it comes to the big moral issues, we're seeing our government do nothing with that. And so, so the government that's coming will be ruling in truth, but that's not going to come until man's ruling authority comes to an end. The world has been given government from Noah's days all the way through to the future tribulation period. It is the hour of man, the Bible says, and it is a time when man will be in control and he will rule according to the dictates of whatever he believes in and whatever support he can get from the general public and from the voting, uh, from the voting people. The government that comes in finally will not be voted in, folks. It is not going to be a democratic system. The government that comes will be a government of absolute power, which we will address in our message this morning. But it is a government that's coming, and it is described in the Bible in so many places. Let me, let me just assure you, although I think most of the churches in the area do not believe in this literal government. Uh, they do not have a basis for their belief, except they spiritualize the scriptures. The Bible teaches us that there is a very real government with a very real ruler king that is coming and he will rule in this world for one thousand years. Now I want you to think about that. I want you to reflect on the biblical aspect. What does the Word of God say? Not, is, not was what some general populist and devotional theologians might say. I want you to think of what does the author of our salvation the author of the Bible, the giver of truth, what does he say? And so we reflect on that for the next few moments. We read in Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, a verse that you've heard a few times now, but I read it not because there aren't other verses, but because of what this verse tells us. And in the days of these kings, we've talked about them, Shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom? That's the idea that I want us to think about. It is in the days of these kings that God will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. The kingdom that is coming in the final days, not man's kingdom, but God's kingdom on earth, shall never be destroyed. Uh, it's an eternal kingdom. Though it will rule for a thousand years on earth, it continues into the eternal state. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. So there's no follow-up. There's no one to come after that to rule. But it shall break in pieces and consume all these kings. So what is this verse telling us? It is telling us that when the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, our Lord Jesus Christ, comes to establish his earthly rule as the King of the Ages, that he will destroy man's kingdoms. So whatever has been will come to a complete end with the return of Christ, and then he will rule. We read in verse 45, for as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain 
without hands. Without hands, it means this kingdom is not voted in. This kingdom is not man's idea. This kingdom comes from someone who could make this universe and he will establish this kingdom. Not a kingdom of man, but a kingdom of God. We read that it break in pieces the iron, beginning at the bottom of the statue of Daniel chapter 2, the brass, the silver, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold. The great God hath made known this known to the king. The great God revealed this. To whom? Well, he revealed it to Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar had had the dream. It was Daniel who was given wisdom by God to interpret this dream, but the dream was given to Nebuchadnezzar so that the first king of significance for the final world governments was given phenomenal insight as to how it would all unfold down through the ages to come and even to the final kingdom. This, the Bible says, God made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter and the dream is certain and the interpretation thereof sure. You need not look at this in any mystic or spiritualized way. You look at this from a very literal standpoint and this is the kingdom of men and that will ultimately be destroyed by the kingdom of God and the brilliance of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So think about this kingdom. Think about the rule of Christ. Think about the rule of God the only government that has ever ruled in truth. And the first thing that I want you to think about is the scope of this kingdom. The scope of it. How do we know that this is going to be a big kingdom? Well, Alva McLean wrote a book many years ago. And I actually only purchased it maybe 10 or 15 years ago, but I was aware of it and had read excerpts and clips and uh, quotes from it. But I did buy the book because it was something that I needed to have in my library. And he wrote about the greatness of the kingdom. He based it on Daniel chapter 2 verse 35 and uh, he wrote elaborately and in detail about the greatness of the kingdom of God. Well, how do we know it's going to be anything great? Well, listen to, listen to the uh, Daniel chapter 2, verse 35. I want you to notice there that this kingdom will rule over the entire earth. We, we, we do not have any kingdom right now that does that. In the tribulation time, Though it's a false kingdom, it will have control over all peoples and nations, the Bible tells us. But this kingdom, the scope of it, Daniel 2.35, some verses prior to what I read just a moment ago. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and become like the chaff of the summer threshing floor, and the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them, and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain. But listen to the conclusion of the verse. And filled the whole earth. So when the kingdom of Christ comes to smash to pieces everything about the world empires prior to this, he establishes dominion from sea to sea, from coast to coast, and around the globe, and there will not be one square mile anywhere, or so square kilometer anywhere in this world that is not going to be controlled by the king of this righteous government. The scope of it shows the greatness of the kingdom. His government shall be absolute in its authority and power. We notice this from Psalm chapter 72. Psalm chapter 72, verse 9 down through verse 11. 
They that dwell in the wilderness shall bow before him, and his enemies shall lick the dust. I think that may be the only place in the whole Bible where that phrase is stated. But it says in verse 10, The kings of Tarshish and of the isle shall bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba shall offer gifts. Yea, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. Uh, that's prophetic. Now it's either true or it's false. It's either going to happen or it's not going to happen. And guess where we believe, what we believe. We know, we know that what God said will come to pass. And that time is very, very soon. Isaiah chapter 11 and verse number 4, the prophet said, But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. I just want us to realize that those who do not believe in Jesus Christ, but insist on living in rebellion and sin against God, will meet up with a righteous judge one day, only to find out that their future is being slayed, not being comforted, and not being received. Yes, our God is very selective. He does not accept everybody. He accepts those who repent and submit to Jesus Christ, his Son, not those who carry on in sin and unrighteousness and in wickedness. That's why men's hearts need to be changed now and come to Christ while there is time to do so. It will be a government of absolute authority. The second main idea that I bring to you this morning in relationship to this government, the only government that will ever rule in truth, and that is the subjects of this government. Who are the subjects of the kingdom? Well, I want you just to think of the biblical statement, the biblical term about the sheep and the goat nations. At the end of the tribulation period, when the seven years are finished and God's wrath has been unleashed in the last part of the three and a half years, there is a gathering together of all of the survivors and the remaining people of the tribulation and some will remain who are goat nations. That means that they were cohorts together with the Antichrist rejecting God, continuing in their vices, continuing in their self-centeredness, continuing in their sinful lifestyle. They're labeled the goat nations. Some survivors of the tribulation will be considered the sheep nations. The sheep nations will be those who surrender to Jesus Christ. They came to know the Lord during the time of the tribulation. They didn't miss the rapture. They weren't in the rapture because they were unsaved, but they submitted to Christ during the seven-year period, and Israel will be awakened to realize that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, and they will acknowledge him. They will bow the knee their tongues will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, and so have the others who have responded to Christ during the time of the tribulation through the proclamation of the gospel of the eternal kingdom. They will be the sheep nations. The sheep nations are the ones that are invited into the joy of the Lord. They are invited to enter into the kingdom of God not the goat nations. The goat nations are told, depart from me, I never knew you, and will be cast away from the presence of the Lord forever and forever. 
When the Bible says that there shall be two in the field, one shall be taken and the other left behind, that can be easily applied to the rapture because that works very well, but in context, that statement has to do with the judgment at the end of the tribulation where some will be taken away, the other left. The other left to enter the kingdom, the ones taken away for judgment. Two in the field. So what we notice is that Israel has finally submitted to the Lord Jesus Christ. Dwight Pentecost summed it up in seven points, and so I'm just going to basically read those to you if you're taking notes or you're keeping the recordings somehow and you want to learn more, but I don't have time to elaborate on that in a brief sermon, but he did mention the seven aspects of Israel's place in the kingdom era when they have finally submitted to the authority of Christ. He said, number one, Israel will have been converted and restored to the land. Number two, Israel will be reunited as a nation. Jeremiah 3, Jeremiah 33, Ezekiel 20, Ezekiel 37, Ezekiel 39, Hosea 1, and verse 11. Number three, Israel will again be related to Jehovah by marriage. The Bible talks much about that marriage relationship that was fractured through Israel's rebellion and unbelief, but will be reunited to have a living, vital relationship with Jehovah God. Uh, Israel will be exalted above the Gentiles. And I know... There are a lot of issues about anti-Semitism today. Uh, a lot of hatred for Israel. It was very interesting just today to read a headline and then to read the article that said that Iran would like to dig up the remains of Mordecai and of Esther, destroy their graves, and put some honor to the Palestinians in the place of these two Jewish heroes from the days of Persia. The same article showed interest in wiping out Tel Aviv. They're hoping to be able to do that. Death to America, death to Israel, that's the heart cry of these. But one day, that nation will be a part, no doubt, of the goat nations, and Israel will be exalted above them. They will be exalted above all of the other nations, even the ones that enter into the kingdom era. Israel will be made righteous. They are not now. They, they, they like to think that they are chosen of God, but individuals perhaps do not so much, but Israel as a nation does. But they will be made righteous. Righteous because they will respond to King Jesus, who is the only righteous one. And by the way, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 says that he is our righteousness. If you are righteous today, it is because Jesus Christ is in your life. If Jesus Christ is not in your life, you have no righteousness. None. Not even the tiniest little flicker, nothing. For we are dead in trespasses and sins, and only Christ is life and light, and only Christ is righteousness. And the reason that we can say that Israel will be made righteous is because they will respond to Jesus Christ as their Savior. The sixth thing that we want to notice is that Israel will become God's witnesses during the millennium. For the thousand years... Everything about the millennium is going to be the worship of Israel, God's love for Israel, and of course God's compassion and mercy towards the Gentiles who entered into the millennial kingdom. And then number seven, Israel will be beautiful, beautified to bring glory to Jehovah. They cannot now, but they will when all of the change has taken place. So Israel converted will be restored to kingdom promises. Let me read a couple of more verses from Daniel. Daniel chapter 4, 
verses 1 through 3. Nebuchadnezzar the king unto all people. This is a letter he wrote. And he said, nations and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God wrought toward me. How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. Folks, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, saw the coming kingdom and believed in it. How is it that in today's evangelical world so many are departing from any concept of a kingdom on earth? How can we ignore the scriptures? How can we not read the scriptures? For when we read the scriptures, we see what the Bible tells us about this. Even Nebuchadnezzar could see it. We read in Daniel chapter 7, verse number 14. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Daniel 7, 22. Until the Ancient of Days come and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. A couple of verses from the Bible that talks about the saints possessing the kingdom. Uh, God will be good to those who are subjects in the kingdom. For he said in verse 27 of Daniel number, chapter 7, he said, And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him, the subjects of the kingdom. The severity of the kingdom is the final point that I want to bring to your attention, and I must soon come to a close here. But the severity of the kingdom, I want you to notice the nature of the rule of the ruler, Jesus Christ. Psalm 2, verse 9. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Revelation 2.27 And he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of a potter's seed. They shall be broken to shivers even as I received of my father. Revelation 12 verse 5 And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne Revelation 19, verse 15, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. All right? Why the rod of iron? What does that mean? Well, it means that he comes with authority. It means he doesn't come as the little lamb. He came as the Lamb of God. When he came for the salvation of mankind, he came to give his life in love and in passion, compassion, mercy, as the Lamb of God taken to the slaughter. Such will not be the case in the final end. The resurrected Christ, who suffered the anguish of a sinful world, will come and with a rod of iron. The reason? Well, I want you to think about this. Only people who accepted Christ as Savior during the tribulation period will enter the millennial kingdom. We who are alive have been raptured. We will come together with them. We will be co-regents. We will reign together with Christ over the nations of the world. But we have not time to elaborate on that this morning. But Israel and the nations that enter into the kingdom will all, to the last person, every single person in the whole world that enters the kingdom will have been born again, will be a Christian. A man made right by Christ. And these only enter the kingdom. No one, no one else enters into the kingdom. 
What does you must be born again to enter in? What does you must be born again to see the kingdom of God? What does that mean? It means if we're not born again by the Spirit of God, we have no relation to the kingdom of God. We have no relation to heaven. We have, we have no relation to the future blessing of Christ, but only sorrow and suffering and anguish of judgment. And that is why every person that hears the gospel message needs to repent and come to Christ and believe on him as their personal Lord and Savior. So why the rod of iron if these people are Christian that enter into the millennial reign of Christ? Well, remember that the kingdom, not those of us who are with Christ, but the people on the earth, the subjects of the kingdom, will be natural people. They will be procreative people. They will be married people. There's no such thing as the immorality that goes on today. They will be righteously married. They will have offspring. They will have children. The children that they have will respond to Jesus Christ as the Messiah or they will reject him as Messiah. Remember that the seed of Gog and Magog will be very much alive, the seed itself. Remember the seed of Adam will be very much alive because it is still the natural flow of the human gene pool that enters into the millennial kingdom. Saved people, just like you and me, if we receive Christ, we're saved people, but we still have that old sin nature that is with us. That will be transformed when we see Christ. So these people who do not receive Christ, they will have a tendency to rebel against that authority. But they will not have a chance to do so because of the iron rod. That is the authority of Christ to squelch any kind of uprising, revolution, or any kind of rebellion. The child at age 100 will die because he rebelled against the authority of Christ. Man is a sinner by nature. And without the life-transforming power of Christ, without the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit, man will do what man does. He will sin. He will rebel. He will fight against God. That's what man will do. It is seen clearly when the millennial reign comes to an end. When the millennial reign comes to an end, it is then where all of that is revealed, Satan is let loose from the bottomless pit, and he draws all of those who are of the nature of Gog and Magog, all those who are of the nature of Adam. He leads them in revolt against Jerusalem. Isn't that interesting? But God destroys them and casts them to hell, both the dragon, the, the, the satanic individual, together with his followers, so that there will never be war again from the time that the tribulation ends, but only God finishes up the enemy of God and the enemy of righteousness. And it is then that the eternal state comes to be. And Christ will be the Savior, Ruler, King forever, forever, and ever. I plead with you today, if you've heard this message and you have never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, this is the time to do so. Ask Him to come into your heart. Ask Him to forgive your sin. Ask Him to forgive your rebellious nature. Ask Him to come into your life and to make you a child of God. He promised to save all those that would come to him. And so if you call on him, he will save you. He'll give you life eternal. If you, however, reject or overlook or just dismiss the idea of being saved, one day it'll just be too late for you. There is an awful fiery hell awaiting those who reject Christ. There is an awful horrendous judgment for all eternity that is coming in the future. But oh, what a bliss and a joy there is for the believer because he will be with Christ forever and forever. Will you come to him today? In all simplicity of heart and mind, 
Just say, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I know I have sinned, but I am a sinner whether I know I've sinned or not because I know my nature is to be against God. Please change my heart. Cleanse me. Give me a spiritual nature. Give me a new life. Give me, a, give me the forgiveness of all of my sin. Make me a child of God. In Jesus' name I pray this. Amen. Now I'm going to ask you, if you found it in your heart to pray that with me, to repeat those words, and you meant it, why don't you call me and see the number on the screen. Speak with me. I'd like to give you assurance. I'd like to give you some more verses that can help you to know for certain that life eternal and hope of joy is yours forever. I would love to speak with you. And now to close our service today, Mandy and Stephanie and Amanda are going to come and sing a beautiful song for us. So let's just listen as they bring the meeting to a close with this great song. God bless you and have a blessed day.